dark place. It was from an ugly place because life had done a number on me. Amen? And life can do a number on us this morning. But can't nobody do you like Jesus. Amen?
hearted, so heavy laden, God. But you say, come, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Father, I thank you that there has been an exchange this morning for the, the spirit of heaviness, God, for the spirit of worship and the spirit of praise this morning, God. Hallelujah. We bless you and we honor you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you are the Prince of Peace.
Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord, today for all that you are doing. Lord, we thank you that indeed hearts are mended, troubles vanish. Peace and joy, compassion are known in your presence. Great and awesome God. These altars are still open and are always open for anybody who would need to pray. I want to ask God uh, if you'll turn with me to James chapter 4. I want to get into this word because what we find is this. We sing about the presence of God and feeling his presence and the peace that envelops us like a warm blanket on a cold night, the joy that is unspeakable and full of glory, the compassion that never fails, the mercies that are new every morning. But the reality is some who attend church with regularity may never experience such things. And that is actually the topic that the Lord has laid upon my heart for us to discuss today. So as we continue in our study of the book of James, we're going to pick up reading in verse number 6. From the New American Standard, the Word of God declares, and this is speaking of the Lord Jesus, but He gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would touch our hearts, that you would open our ears to hear everything that you are saying to the church this day, that in the presence of Jehovah, we can experience your love, your peace, your miraculous healing, your miraculous blessing as you restore broken hearts, as you restore hope, as you bring all things together for your good. Father, I thank you today for the word you have prepared for us. May it find good, good ground in each and every heart, and may it bear much fruit that we would grow in your grace and knowledge. And for this we give you all praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go ahead and be seated. Uh, as we look at this passage, thank you, brother. We've been studying the book of James, and we have learned a number of things about our walk with God. Among them is the fact that true faith requires action. Amen. Faith without works is dead. Amen. We have in this chapter, as I just read, talked about the need to submit to God, to resist the devil, and he will flee. I would submit to you, however, that many in their Christian walk will do all of these things and still not experience God. Now, I'm not questioning whether you are in a right standing with God, whether you would end up in heaven. But what I'm talking about is experiencing God. You may have true faith that avails itself through action. You may submit to God and say, okay, I'm not going to do things my way. I'm going to do things God's way. You may even resist the devil. And resist those inclinations to live in that ungodly way. But that doesn't mean you will experience God in a personal and powerful way. I'm not talking about acknowledging that God is real. I'm not talking about knowing that God is real. I'm not even talking about being convicted or led by God. I'm talking about experiencing God in a way that shakes you to your core. When you read the Bible, you read how Solomon went to dedicate the temple when it was built. The temple whose construct we mimic in, in our own 
entrance into God's presence. And the, and the Levites, the praise team, began to worship God with such authenticity. Yes. Not with just passion, but with reflection on who God was. So powerful, God showed up. His presence was manifest. It, it looked like a cloud had covered the entire facility. It, it's called the Shekinah glory. It's the cologne of God, the weightiness of God. It was so powerful that they fell upon their knees. The priest couldn't even minister in the yes, word. Yes. Because the power of God was so palpable. And so powerful. When the power and presence of God was upon Elijah, it so invigorated him that he outran a horse Mom. going back to Jezreel. And Gethsemane, when the power of Jesus is revealed, it knocks soldiers flat on their back. In Revelation, John falls on his face as though dead in the presence of Jehovah. The power and the weightiness and the love. On the road to Damascus, the presence of God transforms Saul from a persecutor into Paul, a proclaimer. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about formulaic religion. That gets you to hell in a handbasket pretty quick. I'm talking about experiencing God. Do you understand the church was birthed on this concept? The Holy Spirit filled the upper room where they were in unity praying. And they began to speak with other tongues, came out empowered for ministry. And the city said, what does this mean? They had experienced God in a new way. And people didn't understand what was going on. The reality is this. There's a deeper walk with God. There's a deeper experience with God. But it is not an experience that is given without requirement. You may submit to God. You may resist the devil. Notice, if you resist the devil, he will flee. But if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Amen. In Mark chapter 3, the Bible says, Jesus went up on a mountain and called to himself, those he wanted. He invited them to draw near. And they came to him. That they might be with him. And he might send them out to preach. That they would have power to heal the sickness. And to cast out demons. That's the mountain I want to be on this morning, church. Oh, yes. The mountain in which we stand in the presence of God. Notice the four purposes that Jesus gave. He invited them up on the mountain. And he said, I'm inviting you up so that you can be with me. So I can empower you and send you out to preach that you would have power over sickness and power to cast out demons. That's good. Come on. Amen. That's what nearness to God provides. This begs the question, how do we draw near? How do we get in the presence of Jehovah? How do I get closer to God than I've ever experienced before? I want you to notice in that simple statement, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. My friends, God does not draw near until God is sought. Come on. And I'm talking wholeheartedly. I'm not talking about a salvation. God saves us through grace and the prayer of faith. I'm talking about being in the presence of Jehovah. He says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Well, God wants me to be closer. He'll draw closer. Well, the last time I looked, God was God, not me. Come on. Yeah. And if God said, if you want to be closer, I'll be as close to you as you want to be. But I'll know how close you want to be to me by how close you draw to me. Sure. My friends, we are as close to God as we want to be. Come on. Preach. But make no mistake about it. God does not draw near in this way until God is sought. Think about Moses. Moses saw a burning bush, but God didn't say from the bush, Hey, Moses! God so far, come here! Come here! <laughs> well, I mean, God just talked to Moses right beside him, just all of a sudden appear. How many of us want God to do that in our lives? Just all of a sudden, poof, he's there. And he says, hey, guess what? Here's the deal. Come on. But instead, we see a flicker in the distance. 
we see something on fire that's not consuming and God says, hey, that's me. What are you going to do about it? God did not speak to Moses until Moses drew near, drew near to the bush to find out what was going on. In Jeremiah 29, God promises this. If you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. You see, God ain't playing this halfway heartedness. God doesn't play that game. Look at your neighbor and say, God doesn't play that game. <laughs> that, that thing where we honor him with our lips, but our hearts are far from him. He not have something to say about that. Come on. God doesn't play that game. God, God isn't God is 911. He isn't there whenever you have an emergency to pick up the phone and tell you everything's going to be okay. And then you just leave him until the next emergency. God doesn't play that game. That's not the God I'm talking about. I'm trying to help someone here. If you want a closer walk with God, you've got to pursue him with your heart. And we typically don't pursue God in such manner. We don't pursue God with our whole heart until we hit rock bottom. Right. But I've also come to tell you this. Just because you hit rock bottom doesn't mean you're disqualified from crying out to God. Oh, no. In fact, it's most often when we hit rock bottom that we learn that God is a very present help yeah, sure. in our time of trouble. Listen to this in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Consider this revelation for a moment. Imagine the beauty that Isaiah must have seen when he stood surrounded by the splendor of heaven. Imagine the sounds he must have heard as the angelic choirs boistered out in praise. And the seraphim cried out, Holy is the Lord. Imagine the power Isaiah must have felt as he stood in the presence of Almighty Jehovah, the Ancient of Days, the Alpha and Omega, the Great I Am. A phenomenal revelation indeed, but the path that leads Isaiah to this moment is not as glorious as you might think. He did not see the Lord after a season of prayer and fasting. He did not see the Lord at the apex of his anointing. He did not see the Lord when he was on top of his game. On the contrary, Isaiah encountered God at the lowest point in his life. His world had been turned upside down. The bottom had dropped out. He had questions that seemed to have no answers. His tomorrow held no hope. Notice how it starts off. In the year Uzziah died. Uzziah had been king for 52 years, and it was a prosperous time. Israel won phenomenal battles. They had no need, no want. It was like nothing the people of Israel had seen for generations. It was restoring the nation back to the glory days of David and Solomon. And here's the kicker. Uzziah and Isaiah are cousins. As a result, Isaiah lives a very prosperous life. He's part of the royal family. He's living good. High on the hog, though he wouldn't be on a hog since it's an unclean animal. <laughs> Isaiah is a businessman. He's a religious man. He's a family man. Things are good, but in an instant, things go bad. The bottom drops out. In one moment, his entire life changed through no fault of his own. Because of the foolish actions of another, Isaiah's life has changed. All of his provision, all of his protection is gone. And he begins to seek God like he never sought God before. Friends, don't be discouraged when you must seek God in desperation. A careful and comfortable Christianity will never make its way into the throne zone. Sometimes it's those events in life that draw us to our knees, that bring us closer to God. 
The regular routine of religion may allow you to feel God's presence, but you'll never feel his touch. You'll never feel his embrace. You'll never understand why that person weeps when they sing that song. Why they shout hallelujah when somebody talks about God being a healer. Why they shout hallelujah when somebody talks about God being a provider. A very present help in a time of trouble. You'll never understand in that kind of religion why it is that the greatest blessing of God may not be whether you were healed or your loved one was healed. It may not be whether God provided a blessing in your time. It may just be the ability to wake up and feel the presence of God. Amen. When you get to that place where you don't read your scripture out of obligation, but out of invitation, just to be with God. When you feel his warmth and his assurance, the depth of his love, God said you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Isaiah is in that place. He had relied on people and politics to provide his protection and his provision. He thought this position would remain for generations to come. He was wrong. I have no doubt that Isaiah, when he got the news, there came a moment when he wondered, how am I ever going to get out of this mess? you got to understand, new king is coming in. That means Isaiah's out. His whole world is gone. He's unemployed. And his friend is gone. But instead of worrying and complaining, instead of weeping and worrying, instead of blaming God, Isaiah begins to cry out to God and seek him in a new way. It's in his darkest hour that he sees the Lord. I want you to consider Isaiah's vision. The scripture starts off by saying that as he's drawing near to God, Isaiah first sees God on the throne. Isaiah needed to see God on the throne. He's placed so much confidence in a visible king that he's never encountered the king of kings. You know, many times we have placed others on a throne. We have placed ourselves on a throne. We have served our job, our title, our self-worth, our identity. We put everything but God upon a throne. And inevitably, what you find out is that thing is insufficient. And it's at that moment that we need to realize God's still on the throne. When our world falls out from under us, when it crumbles all around us, Isaiah saw the Lord, and he immediately recognized his I was never really the king. Even though his throne is empty, God is still on his throne. I've come to tell you today, if you have found emptiness in something that you have been trusting for your provision, trusting for your comfort, trusting today for your peace and your future, and you find that it's now empty, I've come to tell you that my God's throne is not empty. There's a lot of problems in this world. I see a lot of headlines. 
There's going to be a stock market crash. There's going to be a Great Depression. There's going to be a mass pandemic. I see my God on the throne. Come on! I still see my God is able. And it's still for me and not against me. I see in his word for he said, hey, all of this is going to happen. Don't worry. I'm still on the throne. There will be death. There will be destruction. There will be people fighting against themselves. There will be kingdoms and ethnicities against each other. But I'm still on the throne, and I'm going to have the final say. see God in his majesty and God in his power. Let me just pause real quick and say that one of my favorite verses in scripture, he sees the train of his robe, the train of God's robe filled the temple. Does anyone know the significance of that statement? Some of you look like you might, but you're worried to say it. <laughs> Kings in that day, when they conquered an enemy, they would go to that king and they would place their foot upon the neck of the conquered king and cut off the robe. And then they would sew that robe onto the end of their robe so that as they walked, the longer their robe, the more enemies they conquered. Now listen to what Isaiah saw. The train of his robe filled the heaven.
Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. You would think that when we're talking about drawing near, there would be a celebration. But what the scripture tells us is that as we draw near, there is a requirement. God will reveal to us that which keeps us from him. Not, not to condemn us, not to crush us, but to reveal to us. This is a problem. Cleanse your hands. James said, listen to Psalm 24. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Remember the mountain we want to be on from Mark 3? Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessings from the Lord. And righteousness from the God of his salvation. Who may ascend into God's presence? The one with clean hands and a pure heart. Your hands represent your work, what you're doing. Your heart represents the motive behind it. You have to consider what you're doing and why you're doing it. Are you building God's kingdom or are you building your own? You see, now we looked at holy hands today. I was a little bit frustrated when I came in today because of this, but I realized God gave me an awesome illustration. Yesterday I was doing some work, and man, I was on a roll, and I didn't even think about putting my latex gloves on. And I started putting uh, epoxy on the back of stones to, to affix them to a house. And when I got done, I realized ah. Ouch. <laughs> that my hands were covered in the filth, and it's epoxy. It's not going to easily. I scrubbed them. <laughs> You see, a whole lot of people raise hands that are much cleaner than mine in the physical today. But when we stand in front of God, we see it's like a glue. And that stuff sticks to us, and we can't get it off. And God says, do you see it now? Do you see the way it has affixed itself to your life? Mm, come do you on. see the way it has discolored? Yeah. Come on, Pastor. I can't, I can't feel with my fingertips. I can't. I can't accurately feel right now. That's what sin does to you. It changes the way you look. It changes the way you feel. Cleanse your hands, God. Thank God that he's got the ultimate cleansing agent. Amen? Amen. Oh, amen. Cleanse your hands. He whose soul has not been given to idols. Anything that has a priority over God's word and God's will is a problem. That's an idol in your life. That's the thing that you worship. Most all people say, I don't worship no idol. It's the one you look at in the mirror. That's the one that you worship. Not sworn deceitfully. This is not just a matter of cursing, using bad language, though the Bible does prohibit that. I see these people wearing these shirts. Jesus loves me and my potty mouth. Um, what Jesus loves is when you read scripture, you find out that God says don't use that language. Come on. Moving on. <laughs> Swearing deceitfully is using your words to build an image or a facade of yourself, a false front that you desire people to believe about you. Or cursing others instead of blessing others. It's, it's talking about you trying to be on top of other people. Do you hear now in James 4 where he's saying, cleanse your hands, humble yourself, because this is what's keeping you from the presence of God. So how can I ascend God's holy hill? Make sure your heart is right. Make sure your mind is right. Make sure your mouth is right. God says, look, I can use you where you're at at the base of the hill, and I love you and I bless you, but until your heart and your mind and your mouth are right, I can't bring you where I want you to be. I want you to draw near to me. But it's not just a matter of, well, I'm going to get closer to the Lord, so I think I will. God says, no, 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 you're not bringing that stuff into my house. Come on. Does that make sense, church? Amen. Some people will run away from such a revelation. Some will be so grieved that they'll try to hide from it. I say he did not. He saw his sin and he admitted his sin. 
He said, I am no different than the people I've been preaching to. I am a man of unclean lips, and I preach among the people of unclean lips. Notice that Isaiah addresses his own sin before he addresses, addresses the sin of the others. <laughs> Come on. Mm -hmm. Some Christians are like the man who went to the psychiatrist's office with the fried egg on top of his head and a strip of bacon draped over each ear and a sausage link in each nostril and says, I need to talk to you, Doc. It's about my brother. <laughs> Before we can minister to others, we must permit God to minister to us. Because until we see ourselves for who we really are, we'll never see God for who he really is. But if we will allow God to do this, this is a tough step. And some of you, you've pursued God with your whole heart. And God has revealed some things. But you're resistant. You don't see the problem with what you're doing there. Or you like that particular thing. You'll never progress any further until you cleanse your heart and your hands. But if you will allow God to reveal that to you and to work with you to purify you, just like Isaiah, here's what you'll find. Your revelation will lead to a revival. I'm not, I'm not talking about a weekly event that the church plans on a calendar. Notice what happens to Isaiah. One of the angels flies, flies to him. Let, let, let me read it starting in verse number 6. Because this is really powerful. Well, let me, let me back up to, to verse 5. So I said, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. So he's confessed. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which was taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. The coal came from the brazen altar where the sacrificial blood of the lamb had been shed. The coal came from an altar that was on fire. This same altar, when Jesus tells Mary, on the resurrection day, don't cling to me. There's something I have to do. He goes to the heavenly temple with the blood of his sacrifice and presents it before God to atone for sin. This is the spot where Jesus pours the blood. Notice that the coals of Isaiah's cleansing came by blood and fire. Mm, come on. And so will yours. By the blood of the Lamb and the fire of God. John the Baptist said, I come and I baptize you with water, but one is coming stronger than I am, whose sail strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Mark 9, Jesus said, everyone will be seasoned with fire. Luke 12, he said, I came to send fire on earth, and I wish it was already kindled. He is a purifying fire, a consuming fire, a refiner's fire. Isaiah saw the Lord, and the fire of God touched him and purified him. You see, it wasn't a formulated prayer that purified Isaiah. It was his humble submission before God, declaring, I am a sinner. To which God responded, I will purify, I will purge that sin out of your life. It, it, it's not just a, a, a prayer that we throw up to God. It is the recognition that it is destroying us and must be removed. And that we're unable to remove it. Why do I say this, this led to a personal revival? Not only because Isaiah has been purified, but because then and only then did Isaiah hear the call of God. You know, we live in a church age in which the empowerment of the Spirit is available to everyone. 
Some of you grew up in a church age where miracles ran rampant in the church. It was not uncommon to see someone come out of a wheelchair. To see someone with polio healed. Someone with deaf ears healed. I remember being at the T.L. Lowry Center when we, um, when we were a part of his ministry. He has since gone on to be with the Lord. You still go to the T.L. Lowry Center down in Cleveland and had the video there when he, I forgot where he was, it was a Muslim nation in Asia. It may have been India, I can't remember. But he went to preach and the religious forces showed up and they warned, don't preach in the name of Jesus here. And so he prayed. And, and his handlers were nervous and were like, they'll kill us. And he said, I've got a word from the Lord. I've got to preach. So he preached that day. They went back to the hotel that night. Later, they find out they had, had burned everything and, and removed everything. He said, if you come back and preach, we're going to kill you. And he prayed again. And God said, you go preach my name. So he went back the next day and began to preach again. And thousands of people were there to listen. And all of a sudden, the police force, the religious police, were lined up in the back, and they started moving forward. And Dr. Lowry said, um, Lord, need some help. <laughs> and the Lord laid it upon his heart, and he said, I know that many people here believe that I am preaching a false god. But to demonstrate the truth of my God, there is someone blind in this congregation. And I say to you, in the name of Buddha, receive your sight. And he said they stopped walking and everyone grew quiet. They looked around and nothing was happening. He said, okay, in the name of Krishna, receive your sight. And nothing happened. He said, in the name of Allah. And all of a sudden the religious police stood up. Because he said the name. Receive your sight. And nothing happened. They started moving forward again. Now they're really mad. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, receive your sight. And sporadically, there was yells. Of Fourteen people rose up and came forward who had been born blind and now had sight. I want to say to But in order to get to that place, why don't we see that in a contemporary church like we once did? Go to Africa. Go to China. You'll see it. Go to South America, you'll see it all the time. Why don't we see it in the West? Cleanse your hands. You Come on. Come on. Purify your heart, you double minded. Make sure God is on the throne and not something else. It's not formulaic, it's relational. That's true. When Isaiah has done this, then he hears the call of God. Praise come on up here. Who shall I send? And who will go for us? Great picture of the Trinity there. And Isaiah says, here am I. Send me. When God says go, the call will go. They don't say, there he is, send him. <laughs> they don't worry about how people will respond. They don't worry about whether they are able, as Jessica was testifying. God doesn't call the equip. God equips the call, she said. They don't worry about whether they are worthy. Whether they're too old. They're too uneducated. None of that matters because they've been cleansed by the blood and filled with God's fire. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19, says this. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. You see, this is a day of new revelation. This is a day of new cleansing. This is a day of new calling. But before you get to that calling to do a great work for God, here's my question. Who is on your throne? To what are you most devoted in life? What do you spend most time on? And is it the person you look at in the mirror? Is it an image you're trying to portray? Who is on the throne of your life? God says, we'll start here. I'm on the throne. 
you will have no other gods before me. Once you see and acknowledge God, you're going to be on the throne. Then let God show you if he is not already. In Isaiah's writings, the prophet will say, Know you not, Isaiah 42, your sins separate you from God. Draw me close to you, the psalm said. Never let me go. God says, I will draw you closer than you can imagine, but your sin will be a wedge between us. You can't get any closer than your sin will allow. Why? Because he's a holy God. And he says, as long as you're holding on to that sin, how are you going to hold on to me? Let God purify you. Don't, don't be condemned by that statement. Here's what God, there's things in my life that I hate that I do. But here's what God says. I'll forgive you. I'll purify you. Have you been struggling with the sin in your life and you just can't seem to set it down? That's the point. God says you can't. If you could, you would have. But there's some things that we just can't purge out. It's ingrained in us. But God says, I have a hot coal from the fire. Covered in the blood of the Lamb, invigorated with the fire of God. Let me touch your life with that. Let me purge you. Let me purify you with that. Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Bring it to God. Then, have your spiritual ear open. Because God will ask the question, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Advance that moment, please. And then you can say, here am I. You see, there's too many people in the world who are really representing themselves but using the name of God. This should come as no shock to anyone. What God is looking for are people who will replicate Christ, the love of Christ, the compassion of Christ, the power of Christ. God loves the worship of his saints. Not because he's egotistical and craves it, but because it brings us into fellowship with him. You know what else God loves? When he hears someone say, here am I. Not because he needs us to do, God can do all of this all by himself. But when we say, here am I, that's our way of saying, you're on the throne and I've been purified. I am equipped through you to get this done. And I will partner with you to get it done. And God says, oh, we're about to spend a whole lot of time together. <laughs> Here's what no one preaches about Isaiah. Here am I, send me. You know where God sent him? To a horrible church. <laughs> Read your Bible. They wouldn't listen to it. They wouldn't respond to it. Didn't matter to Isaiah. Because God was with him. That's right. Come on. You know what's amazing that when God's with you, all of the situations around you don't seem to matter. Come on. Come on now. As long as I've got God, I've got everything. That's what it takes. If you want to draw near to God today, that's what it takes. Father, we thank you, Lord, today. And as we prepare our hearts to draw close to you, Lord, give us the understanding, the truth that you are on the throne. And show us anything else that we've allowed to be God of our lives. To direct us. To control us. To rule us. To drive us. God, reveal to us our dirty hands, our dirty hearts. Not that we may leave here feeling unworthy and beaten down, but that you may purify us and we will leave here knowing not only are we forgiven, but we are cleansed. Sanctify us this day by your truth. Remove that tendency, that desire from our hearts. We give it unto you. Father, I believe some will hear a call today as you lay upon their hearts what you have called them to do. May the echo of Isaiah's words be pleasing to you. Here am I. Send me. Thank you, Lord.
this altar is open to all who would draw near unto God.